Hi everyone and welcome to my new guide for the Twisting Blades Rogue in Season 2. I've been playing this character from 1 to 100 in the Hardcore Solo self hunt race and well it turns out Twisting Blades Rogue is still really busted and really fast. So the total time to complete level 100 for me was 20 and a half hours completely solo and what you see here is some of the footage that is from my stream here when I did my 1 to 100 run. It was all done in one session so that was quite a blast. And I want to go over the entire build and show you all the new updates and how everything works. I've already reworked the guide for it. So we have the Maxwell guide here. This is the end game version. Uh, this is completely reworked for season two. There's also the 1 to 50 leveling version. So when you get started, you have, um, you know, a bit more detailed with all the different skills here, etc. as you progress to level 50. And I also have the default planner here. So you can just click on this. Or you can find it on my Discord. There's a channel with all of my D4 planners as well. And then you have the different skill tree, Paragon, and also the different uh, progression steps here with level 50 and leveling and uniques and so on. So this is basically what you see here in the guide with a lot of info as well. But what you need to know is that if you have played the Rogue before, then it is not really that much different from before, but the scaling is very different. So in Season 2, Blizzard has decided to add more multiplicative scaling options to the game. For example, we have the Close Quarters Combat Passive now. So this is the in-game character. And uh, this is now scaling with damage versus crowd-controlled enemies. And you see here, for example, that uh, your damage is increased multiplicatively by 40% of your damage versus crowd-controlled bonus. And I have an increase of 138% on this character right now. This is not even fully optimized. I think it can get something like 170 or so total with like perfect gear and everything. But you can definitely tell that this is a pretty crazy damage boost. So this is the reason why I switched from originally uh, Momentum uh, from last season to Close Quarters Combat because you have this insane damage multiplier now and it can scale this up really high. And also another major change that I made is that now we are running Poison Imbuement instead of Cold Imbuement. You might have played this build before and Compared to last season, the game has become a bit harder, I would say, because there's no Barbara anymore. We're not like absolutely annihilating or destroying everything with like one attack anymore, basically. And also, it seems like bosses have been beefed up quite a bit. So uh, I was kind of predicting that uh, we would fight bosses for quite a while. So I put in the poison imbuement, and that was a really good choice. And poison and dots in general also have just become much better in season two because they nerfed crit. And they also like added a few vampiric powers that actually scale poisons quite well. So in general, dot builds are in a really good spot. And this is why it's there, to like make sure that the boss fights and the elites just are really short and they just melt. And this works really well. Other than that, the setup is not really all too much different. There are some new uniques to play around with. For example, I put in T-Bot's Will for the best in slot setup. But this is kind of optional. If you want to have more defenses, then you can just use any legendary. Right now, I'm also not using this pair of pants. I found one, but it's a really bad roll, so I have not actually tried it out yet. However, it is a pretty good item, but any of the new armor pieces works pretty well. There's also the God Slayer Crown. Um, there's also the Penitent Grief still. So all of these kind of work, and you can kind of like choose which one you want to include in your setup with a bit of like upsides and downsides for each of them. One thing to note here before I go into all the details of the exact setup is that because this build has poison imbuement, it is actually a bit stronger than intended because there are some bugs with poison imbuement and the blade dancer aspect in particular. Blade dancer is the aspect that makes your twisting blades spin around you when they return to you. And uh, I also have this uh, disclaimer here basically in the guide that says that it uh, basically explains all these points. But in the end, the poison in particular of this build is way stronger than intended and that might get nerfed at any moment. That would not really mean that you have to change the setup very much when that happens, but your boss fights in particular are going to be noticeably slower if that ever gets fixed. So that is something to be aware of. Other than that, it's definitely like a top tier build and even after a potential bug fix, it will remain a top tier build. Twisting Blades is just extremely fast. You fly through the maps and there is like <laughs> really almost no competition for something like that. So going over the planner here, let's start with skills. We have Puncture as our basic attack. So Puncture is just overall very useful. It gives you slow, it gives you energy, and it gives you vulnerable. And it's also relatively fast, so you can build combo points with this. This build runs combo points. 
You can play this with Inner Sight. A lot of people ask me about this, but I definitely suggest combo points. There's two reasons. Number one, I just think Inner Sight has too low uptime to really be that useful, and you can solve your energy with other ways like Umbral Ring or Ravenous Ring or even Energizing Aspect. And also, the vulnerable uptime is actually still really useful. It's only a 20% multiplier now, but it is still a noticeable multiplier. And he might have some odd vulnerable damage from, for example, Exploit Glyph or from some item roll or something like that to make this even stronger. And also, it gives you the close quarter combat synergy. So I showed this earlier. Close quarters combat, you need to have a marksman and a cutthroat skill. So you need to use one of the ranged generators. And I think Puncture just does the job pretty well. So I recommend that. Then we have Twisting Blades. We have the uh, improved Twisting Blades upgrade. This gives you days. This is very powerful because... First of all, you completely disable any target that you're hitting. You can run into a pack, you can hit the elite, and it will never attack you. It will never cast any uh, abilities. So this is really powerful for defense. And you can also trigger other effects, like the Umbro Ring. Um, well, funny enough, I didn't find a single one of these yet, but you can trigger it. <laughs> and also, you can get stuff like um, the Rapid Gambits here, where you evade cooldown resets more quickly, and you can also get trick attacks. If you really want, you can even throw in Concussive there. This is a choice that I uh, removed over this season because crit has kind of like lost a lot of value. This build doesn't run a lot of crit necessarily, so it was not really that necessary. But you can do that, and the days is just really powerful. And the cooldown reset after the nerfs from pre-season 1 just is not really that great anymore in my opinion. Then we have uh, Shadow Step and Dash here, so it's just extra mobility. You want to jump around as much as possible. You have the lower cooldown here on Shadow Step. Dash, just one point. It's like a really good skill on its own. And like this, you are extremely mobile. You can just use them whenever you want. You can jump in. And we're also going to get a second charge for Shadow Step from the Ravager Boots. And we also have Ghost Walker on the Amulet. So we go really fast with double mobility on uh, those aspects. And like this, you have two charges on Dash and two on Shadow Step. And you can just fly around the map. So this feels amazing. And you can just press the buttons whenever you want, basically. And then we have a bunch of passives here. So these are typical like damage passes, weapon mastery, exploit, malice. There's uh, siphoning and sturdy. Um, yeah, a bunch of stuff basically that just helps you out. Down here, we also have innovation for a bit of energy recovery and haste for extra movement speed and extra attack speed. So these are just like overall useful passives that are included here. And then we have the two imbuements up here. So the first one you pick up is Shadow Imbuement. Uh, just even when you're like very low level, this is really powerful because uh, it gives you those AoE explosions. So this is like the AoE skill. Whenever there's like a big pack of small monsters, you try to Shadow Imbue and then you can either dash through the pack or you can Twisting Blades and then, you know, Shadow Step to the other side and your blade follows you and hits all of these guys. And then they just blow up. And the best case is you do this when you have low energy because then you get consuming shadow procs and your energy refills. So this is one of the ways to regenerate a lot of energy on this build. And then there's the second imbue. This is the poison imbuement. So the way this works is that you cannot use two imbuements at the same time. You either want to use one or the other depending on the situation. And this is your single target tool. So when you attack, you, for example, fight an elite or a boss, you use poison imbuement. And preferably, you build three combo points first because you can actually buff the entire attack, including the imbuement, with the combo points so that you deal a lot more damage with that. So you have two users, and usually is go to the boss and do like one, two, three, puncture, poison imbuement, twisting blade, one, two, three, puncture, poison imbuement, twisting blade. Uh, the poison imbuement will be still up, but you get the point. And there's um, a bit of extra scaling here, extra duration. Sometimes you crit, you get a bigger poison. And like this, you can melt those bosses. And most of the time, I was killing bosses either in like one use of Poison Imbuement or maybe two uses. So 13 seconds cooldown. That's really quick. And uh, that was working just fine, even on high level bosses. I was farming Nightmare Dungeons, yeah, most of the time, like five to 10 levels above my character. Up to 10 levels is the maximum that you need to do if you want to get extra XP. So I have been running really fast. And I was able to do even those higher level bosses relatively easily. For the item aspects, we have a bunch of defenses here and a few uh, offensive powers and resource. Resource is relatively important. So I already mentioned there's Umbro Ring. So if you get this with like a, at least a two or a three, this is really good. Other than that, I would suggest energizing aspect until you get that. Personally, I have never gotten an Umbral so far this season. <laughs> 
So this is a pretty rare one. You really want to gamble those rings if you try to get this, but the build works without it anyway. Uh, one important thing is the Ravenous. You can get this very easily with a good roll just from the Codex. I was also just running the Codex version of this and it was just fine. So you have to do a stronghold to get the Codex power here. Actually, most of these powers are actually Codex powers, as you can see here. So there's only like a few that are not in the Codex, which is uh, the Ravagers for the double shadow step, but it's not really like uh, necessary for this build to work. But outside of that, basically everything is in a codex. So that's a really uh, big advantage of this entire setup here. You can just, you know, every time you find a new item, you just throw something on there and that's it. Yeah. Outside of those resource aspects, you also want resource generation rolls on these rings. So you see here, if you can get rings like that, this is a huge benefit because early on, you are definitely resource stuffed quite a lot. You have to use puncture quite a lot. You have to play around your shadow imbument a lot to get your consuming shadow procs. But later on, this really relaxes as you go. And once you have the setup here, you're not going to have any trouble anymore. And whenever you're just fighting trash mobs, then you basically never have to use a puncture almost at some point. So early on, quite a bit more. This is also why there's combo points. And then later on, you just don't really care about your resources that much unless you're fighting bosses, for example, or some elite fights here and there. And then you use a puncture a bit more. And you don't have to always go for free combo points necessarily. You can also do like one-to-one -one rotations, you can do two-to-one rotations. That always depends a bit on the situation. How is your energy going right now? How long is the fight? But most of the time when you have short fights, you barely use your puncture basically. So this is how you handle the resources. And then for the offensive aspects, we have edge masters on the crossbow. We have uh, corruption for extra um, imbuement power so this gives you uh, bigger explosions from shadow gives you bigger poisons etc then we have the blade dancer this is the spinning blades uh, this is on a one-handed weapon even though this is the main power here because generally your resources should be relatively high with edge masters and also because of the poison bug uh, those spinning blades always apply 100 percent damage not just 15 or something when they spin with poison imbuement so this is really powerful and like this we have edge masters on the crossbow to double it so that you get more power out of that. But in general, uh, it doesn't matter. You can also do the blade dance on the crossbow if you want, if you want to have a bit more like, you know, general damage. But with this, you have the biggest poisons. So this is why we have it like this. Then we have Ghost Walker and Amulet. This is optional. This is basically just extra speed to go even faster. But I really like that. You also can run through enemies. If you ever feel like you are in trouble or you're dying too much, or you just need more damage, you can definitely include something else here. You can put the expectant as an offensive power, for example, or you can put like Umbrus as a defensive power, for example, or protecting. There are some options here. Emulate is kind of like a joker piece and you can do whatever you want if you feel like you need more damage or defense. But for the most part, if you're going fast, this is the choice here. And as for our defensive powers, so we have the might aspect every six seconds. You want to use at least one puncture for the 20% damage reduction. We have disobedience for the extra armor procs. This is really powerful. There's shared misery. So this has uh, various synergies. So number one, you just uh, spread the days from your twisting blades, for example. So this just goes everywhere. Then there's also the uh, lucky hit, chance to slow in the glove. As you can see, this is another a crowd control proc that also triggers some stuff on the paragons. This triggers the control glyph, for example, if you're using that. And can you do, can you give it a proxy here? So this is really useful. And then a shared misery, you spread all of that stuff around. So that's really nice. Uh, there's Tibot Zor right now in the unique setup, but without uniques, you have the cheats aspect for extra damage reduction against crowd control targets. This has the same synergy here with the slow, for example. Or for example, if you use penitent griefs, if you have those, then cheats will also proc from that, for example. So you can do some options there. Uh, for the late game, I have this pair of pants. This is a new one. Uh, drop some durial so kind of hard to acquire kind of late game thing but as i mentioned there are some other unique options here as for your stop priorities what you really want is the damage versus crowd controls so this can roll on the weapons uh, so both crossbow and uh, one hand weapons and also the rings so you want to try to get as much of this as possible this is again because of the close quarters combat passive and also is a decent uh, damage boost in general because you are actually crowd controlling a lot of enemies as I just explained with the shared misery and the slow and the daze so this generally just triggers really quickly anyway and then you get this big multiplier here from the close quarters combat so I want to get as much as possible this is the number one priority and then there's a bunch of other kind of decent stats on many slots but nothing really too required out of that you want to get 
resistances. So make sure you cap your resistances at the very latest by level 80, I would say, maybe 75 already. Basically, as you enter torment difficulty, capping resistances is really important. And you can do that the best way possible with your boots. So you can get a triple res pair of boots and then you have one on the helm and then you have four out of five of those resistances covered and the rest you can do with your jewelry sockets. So this is usually how I have that in my planners. Four rolls and then one is covered through the jewelry and then there's kind of like one extra socket here that you can just use in case one of the resistances is really low or something like that. Of course, you might not be able to do this right away. Sacred items have lower resistance values and you might not get perfect rolls and all that. So you might have to go for more resist rolls. So for example, if you look at this here, I have triple res on my boots. I have uh, two resists here. I have, uh, I think, another one here. So I'm quite overcapped with this, actually. So you see here, I have 176 and 130 and 120 and 170, 150. So I have too much and I'm trying to get rid of this. But early on, you might actually want to go for more resist rolls. Make sure you cap those resists as early as you can, because that really helps you to survive. And then also you want to get a lot of armor. So you see here right now, unbuffed without disobedience aspect, I have 10.5k armor. So against the 100 monsters this is actually overkill. And then comes disobedience aspect as well. So I'm going to like 14,000 or something. This is actually more than you need for any monster in the game. How much armor you need to have at a given level depends on the, on the level of the monsters. For level 100 monsters, you want 9.2k armor for the 85% damage reduction cap. And against level 154 monsters, tier 100 nightmare engines, you want 13.5k buffed with disobedience. So this is kind of the target to aim for. Usually you do this with like maybe two armor rolls. So I have one here on the helm, for example. I have one on the chest here. Yeah, maybe three armor rolls. So that depends a bit on like what exactly you have, how high item power your items are, and what are your rolls, etc. So there's also a bit of um, like min-maxing you can do on the Paragon tree, for example. There is like armor nodes here for example there are armor nodes here for example so you can also like either add or remove some of these as you go just to make sure that you have also a decent amount of physical damage reduction from the armor and together with the resistances these actually build most of your defenses other important roles are the resource generation on the rings that i mentioned and the twisting blades ranks on the glove so this is like your most important damage multiplier role basically you want to get those four ranks if you can you can also get stuff like attack speed and crit but the Twisting Blades and the Lucky Hit Slow are the most important in my opinion. And then the other two stats if you can. Uh, whenever you have your resistances kept and you can afford to change some of those uh, item rolls around. You want to have something like cooldown on the helm, poison or shadow imbuement ranks here on the helm. You can also get maximum life, which is not bad. You can get these damage direction rolls on chest and pants. So if you don't need to roll more resistances, then you can get that stuff. And it's going to make you really tanky later on. And offensively, there's not really all that much other than that. Like there's a damage to crowd controlled. Uh, on the weapons, I also have like core skill damage, for example. This is also really powerful for the poison beam and scaling. And then just all stats, dexterity. Uh, you can also get other stuff that could be like vulnerable damage. That could be like close enemy damage. So there are some other stats that are also useful here, but this is the perfect distribution. And also for the weapon choice here, you see I have daggers. So many people used to run swords in the past. I think daggers are slightly better. However, it doesn't really matter all too much. You can just use whatever is the best weapon that you have. There are some pros and cons for both. Now jumping into the Paragon tree, the final setup looks like this. We also have uh, progression steps here. So you can see this here in the level 50 of Codex variants. You can like see this step by step if you look at down here. This is also what we have in the endgame guys. So on the Paragon boards, you see the entire progression here. I can also just like slide this and you see how it progresses. So you start out here on the starting board, nothing special. Make sure you pick up the all res as well. This is something that people usually didn't do in the past. You want to get that. Then we go to the cheap shot board. This has all those damage to crowd controlled enemies. So there's a lot of here. Uh, we also buff this with efficacy for even more damage versus crowd control with the close quarter combat scaling. He has calculated, he has oppressed, and there's also decent defensive stuff like safeguard, for example. So this is a really powerful board on many rogue builds now that use this key passive. Lots of damage versus crowd controls. And outside of that, we don't really use that many important like other nodes here. You see here, this is like a fairly straightforward Paragon setup. The only other legendary that we pick up here is Tricks of the Trade because you have the Marksman skill Puncture and then you have the Cutthroat skill 
uh, Tracing Blades. So usually, at least against bosses, for example, or against elites, uh, the best way to do this is to do at least a one-to-one -one rotation so that you proc tricks of the trade and you have like better energy economy. You have just a lot of damage buffs like this. You make sure you apply the vulnerable all the time, etc. So once you have this, at least it becomes a bit more important to use your puncture sometimes, but it's not really required for like most fights where you can just like spam twisting blades and everything dies around you. But you see here, the rest is just picking up a lot of glyphs. So another glyph we have here is versatility. This buffs your non-basic and your non-core skills. So you might wonder why is this here? Well, number one, it gives us uh, magic nodes bonuses, so more core skill damage and core skill damage and also cutthroat skill damage is a pretty big multiplier for the poison imbuement in particular because of um, some of those bugs I mentioned earlier. I think this is a bug, but this is uh, a really good stat to stack basically. And this non-basic and non-core skills includes the imbuements, so this makes your poison imbuement stronger, this makes your shadow imbuement stronger. So you get these bigger explosions, bigger poisons, but your um, Twisting Blades skill itself does not increase by all that much. This is kind of like an optional choice. I actually did not use this one myself in my actual run to 100. I would use it probably later on, but I was running with the Control Glyph. So instead of this, I had Control, which gives you damage to the crowd controlled. So this is also relatively powerful. And it gives you um, also the secondary effect here when they are slowed or chilled. So for example, from your lucky hit chance to slow on the glove, or if you run Pain and Greaves, then you also get this extra 10% damage multiplier there. So it's really nice. And it scales your close quarters combat even further. So I kind of got stuck with this because it was like the first glyph I found and all the other glyphs I wanted, I just found way later. So I just kept, kept going with control glyph. That was also fine. Then we have um, the tricks of trade board here. So this was a uh, cunning spider gem, by the way. Uh, tricks of trade board here. So we pick up the legendary and then another glyph here. Here we have the turf for the close damage and the close damage reduction. Really nice. There's also brawler for the same stuff. So this is like our board here to get a bunch of damage reduction. There's a bunch of armor as well. Really nice stuff. And then the last board is the No Witnesses board. This has two good rare nodes with life and damage. And here we have the Exploit Glyph that gives us vulnerable damage and more importantly the vulnerable proc every time you hit something. You can, for example, apply vulnerable for, first of all, 20% extra damage and for stuff like the Corruption aspect here, as you can see. So this is um, a really powerful glyph because it just gives you these procs all the time. And uh, one thing that you might notice when you look at the progression here, and this is a level 50 setup, we have blended shadow imbuement that gives you vulnerable when shadow imbuement explodes. But later on, once you have the exploit glyph, you actually switch this to mixed shadow imbuement, so you have more non-physical damage. So this buffs the shadow imbuement attack itself, and this also buffs the subsequent poison imbuement attack. So you can actually use both of these even on single target, and you have even bigger poison damage here. So this is uh, also why exploit glyph is in there it's really useful. When you're low level, you might have to swap around some of these cliffs here. So you can see this here, uh, when they're all level one, then uh, for example, the exploit glyph uh, can be activated here on the second board, but later on, it's kind of like a not so relevant damage boost. So you wanna try to get the secondary activated as fast as possible, but later on, you just swap it to this board here, for example, once you have it level to 15, because it increases in size. And then you can also like activate it on a different board. So there are some glyph stops here as you progress, but for the most part, it's basically the same glyphs, just maybe in a different spot. And this is about it. So the setup I just explained is basically the standard variant of the entire build. So you can see all of this here in a lot of detail. If you want to read the guide as well and like, you know, check out some steps here. There's also some further explanations, resource management, the gear progression. So here's like all of the aspects listed where you can get them, etc. Here's the progression steps with different setups as well. This is all exactly the same from the planner, so you can go check that. And also like how the skill tree might change. There's like a few points that move around, as I said. And then we, down here, we have the little 100 endgame variants. So they are actually fairly similar. So speed farming is basically the standard stuff. Then we have the pinnacle boss that is like a lot more uh, defensive and also has um, the poison trap in there. It has bursting venoms and a similar thing here for nightmare dungeon push where we also have um, the Bursting Venoms aspect. So this allows you to create this poison pool under you. This was actually buffed, and as I mentioned, poisons is really good in this season. So this is just crazy to do high single target damage when you have really tanky targets. So you attack with poison emote skills, and then you uh, have like this proc, and when you stand in it, you have 
permanent poison imbue. So you can just mill targets like this whenever this triggers. And it's somewhat easy to trigger actually because you have uh, precedent points. So we can uh, put that on uh, one of the other items here. So for example, on the Pinnacle Boss variant, we have that, the, pin the precedent points here. And like this, your puncture can be poison imbued and this can actually trigger the bursting venoms. And like this, you get much more of those poison puddles and whenever that triggers, you just destroy basically. So there is a bit of a, a bit of tweaking here going on with those setups, but just to go over this real quick. So the T109 Benunjin setup, we have the smoke grenade. So the skill tree looks slightly different. We remove the dash, or you can also remove the shadow step. Both of this works depending on which one you like more. And then you get in the smoke grenade here. So you have uh, the daze, you can like disable a pack from a distance. You get the extra damage taken. And then you can also spread this daze here with the shared misery. Once again, this makes it much safer. And um, for example, on the pinnacle boss variant, uh, here we have the poison trap so that it can reset your poison imbuement and you also have the dark shroud here so you like, have better defense like this for example when you fight Lilith you might actually be able to tank a wave or you might be able to tank a skull it is still quite difficult to do so you need a lot of damage reduction for that to work but it is possible when you have you know the, the right setup and sometimes at least you can survive these you can also go for a more glass cannon approach, at, le at least against Lilith. You don't really need much damage reduction if you actually dodge everything. And I've killed Lilith just fine with my fresh level 100 character. She was nerfed a bit now. So it's not such a big challenge anymore because you just do so much damage, you really melt her. So this is basically how this is going. There's also some tweaks to the Paragon setups. So for example, if you compare this to the normal version that I just described, if you go to the T109 Dungeons or the Pinnacle Boss here, um, there's like one notable change, which is we have to all the same boards, but I think I removed a few like rare nodes, for example, to pick up Eldritch Bounty here. So you get like this extra 20% uh, multiplier with your imbuance. So this is like a pretty decent extra damage effect. So that's what I included here. If you want to optimize your setup more towards boss killing, uh, you can do that. You can also just run with this setup here. I'm not sure exactly what now I removed, but uh, basically I removed a few points from some glyphs and I think one rare cluster so that I have enough points to actually go up there and pick up this node here. So that is an option, but in general gameplay, you don't really need that. And uh, I have like a, just a more well-rounded setup otherwise. But the build works just fine. So here's some footage of my T100 Nightmare Dungeon clear. This was also on day one. I have a full run uploaded on YouTube if you want to watch that from my live stream. And uh, it was working just fine. The defense is okay. And this was still with like a very unoptimized setup. So, you know, I hadn't really grinded anything. And uh, at least now in season two, there is definitely a reason to keep grinding better items at level 100. You know, my glyphs are not even optimized. I have all of them like barely level 15, basically. And I'm still melting through those T100 monsters here. And once you optimize this a bit further, you can definitely keep grinding T100s really fast in a matter of minutes and get really high level loot if you want to go for that. So this is basically the setup that I was playing here. And that's also about it for the guide. So hope you enjoyed this. I'm having a blast in season two, especially Rogue. Uh, just is as fun as always, or even better. And I'm actually going to be playing quite a bit of Rogue. I'm already leveling a second one here. I have like a level 70 Rogue again. Um, this one is still alive, but I just wanted to play another one. And uh, there's probably going to be more guides coming. I'm about to respect that second Rogue to a Reign of Arrows build. So let's see how that goes. And I might have some more build guides for you soon. Hope you enjoyed this video here. I wish you good luck with the rest of the season and I'll see you guys next time.